working, trying to make websites accessible the entire time. And it's interesting how your knowledge kind of evolves. Um, uh, in addition to working client projects, I'm also the lead of the, uh, of the Drupal uh, front end theme initiative to create a, a new default theme for Drupal. It's going to be called Olivero, and we'll probably go into that a little bit. And uh, that's going to be, th that is very accessible. And I have some cool examples to talk about uh, today. And Kat, how about you? I am Kat Shaw. I'm a senior front end developer for Lullabot. I've been here for almost two years. Um, I've been a web developer for, for over 20 years, unbelievably. Um, and I got started in accessibility when I worked actually in local government in Douglas County, Kansas as their webmaster. So we had a really small crew and I was the only web person. So I got, had to juggle a bunch of roles there. Um, and I saw a presentation that maybe I'll talk about later from somebody and it really opened my eyes uh, to accessibility and got started from there. And um, yeah, that's where I got started. So I, I live in uh, Kansas, actually, just so you know where I'm at in the middle of the country. All right. Um, we have one more person on the call, Matt Robison. Uh, he's the one who organized this whole thing for us today. Matt, would you like to give a little introduction for yourself? Uh, yeah, I've been with Lullabot for about seven years now. And um, I've been a back-end developer with Drupal for over 10 years. And now I help out the marketing team here. So happy to be here and listen in. All right, all right. Well, we do have the Zoom Q&A line open. So if you have any questions for our panel, for our group, or you'd just like to participate in the discussion, please jump into the Zoom room, pop a question in there. We'll try and get those around to everybody and get some answers. So to kick it off, I kind of have a question that I'd like to pose to everyone and get some uh, thoughts around. So Helena, when you and I first started promoting accessibility as an internal working group, I learned a lot from some of the things that you had said. Obviously, I realized that accessibility was important, but there were a lot more facets to it than what I knew about. And I come from a back end developers realm, so I'm not as in tune with the front end. So I'd like to kick it off with a question around what you all believe is the most overlooked piece of accessibility that somebody could reasonably go in and fix without having to dig too deep into the interwebs and Google too deep for the solution. And if you could all give something different, no copying answers from the, the person before you. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you were thinking, Mike. We've worked together way too long. Uh, but to be fair, I will go in reverse order this time. Uh, so Kat, why don't you give us yours first? Okay, sure. Um, I would say uh, color contrast issues would be one that that people can can definitely start off with so um you know you can have you know links would be a good example um just you know making sure that they meet the the 4.5 to 1 color contrast for regular text and 3 to 1 for large text um so looking at the LACAG standards for those would be really important um and you know just understanding that, I think that's a big part. I think also just um, understanding like uh, if you have photos on your site and you decide to put text in front of them, uh, understanding that that needs to also meet color contrast um, requirements. So um, either having some kind of setup where you have something behind the text so that it's easy to discern the text um, in front, uh, that's in front of the photo or having some kind of treatment in front of the photo um, so that it does meet the color contrast requirements. Those are the important things to keep in mind. So that's where I go. That's a good one. That Thank is you. always one that I struggle with. And I know there's some tools you can put into your browser that actually give you that contrast uh, or tells you uh, if you have the right contrast, I think. But I wanna, we'll, we'll come back to that one in a bit here. Mike, I wanna know what yours is. So I have a pet peeve uh, that I see like with, um, you know, accessible websites. And, and, and whenever I visit a website, I typically do this. So like if, if all the listeners are, you know, you're listening to this and you're like, does Mike visit the website? The answer is yes. And I also <laughs> like test it because I just have a habit of doing that. So he'll be judging uh, you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I totally do judge. So uh, <laughs> the, um, 
uh, uh, the answer, to, my answer to this question is uh, accessible navigation, like primary navigation. And, and there's a lot of, there's a number of different uh, kind of factors to this. Like, is your navigation keyboard navigable? Like, so can you hit the tab button and go to it? What about your sub navigation? Can I navigate down into your sub navigation? Does your sub navigation automatically open through like focus within, you know, or, or, or do I have to hit a button to do that? You know, uh, are the focus states set up? So if I'm tabbing through, I actually know, you know, you know what the active element is and things like that. Um, and uh, what about if I hit like the escape key on the keyboard? Will like sub menus close? You know, is it possible? Uh, another thing that I look for is like if the sub menus are hidden, they should not be focusable. They should only be focusable if they're visible. So, you know, can I tab to them and then like I'm tabbing over a hidden element? So yeah, ta-da. Yes, keyboard nav is definitely a big one. Uh, let's go down to Helena. I wanna hear what yours is. And it's can't right. be keyboard I nav and it can't be contrast. Nope. Okay, no, nope. they didn't take mine, thankfully. Oh, good. Um, I think the one that people usually don't think of, it's really easy to remember the physical disabilities, you know, like uh, screen readers and things like that. But a lot of people forget about cognitive disabilities. Um, so things like making sure that your navigation is in the same place and in a predictable pattern throughout your entire website, making sure that you have enough white space so things aren't cluttered. Um, things like that make it really easy to use your website for people who are suffering from maybe dementia, Down syndrome, uh, sensory processing disorders, um, especially like a parallax can make people really seasick. So not using effects like that. Um, I feel like those kind of get lost in the shuffle and, and what really stuck with me was I was interviewing people with all sorts of different types of disabilities. And I was interviewing this young woman with Down syndrome. And she said, I'm really excited that you wanted to interview me about this because nobody ever cares what I think about anything. Um, and that really like wrote itself on my heart. I was like, wow, like we need to do better when it comes to cognitive disabilities and web design. Yeah, you know, that's interesting you mentioned that because I, I did um, the elections, I worked the elections this last time. And uh, one of the um, responsibilities they gave me was working with people with cognitive disabilities um, and helping them to vote. Um, so I helped um, one young lady um, who had to stay in a vehicle who actually knew who, um, you know, and helped her vote. And and that was uh, really nice to help her to vote and, and all of that. But the the other situation was with somebody that really had a hard time just focusing on the voting. And I just, I could feel her frustration, even understanding like who she was voting for and just focusing on each one and how complicated just the ballot was when, uh, when I was sitting there with her trying to understand who she was voting for and reading through the questions and, and all of that. And it, it really made me understand like, and, and feel like, wow, you know, sometimes you just automatically put stuff on your website and you think somebody's going to understand it, but you really need to sit back and think, you know, not everybody is going to want to read through a whole paragraph of text. It's really about simplifying things and writing in plain language and uh, getting to the point, you know, of what you're trying to convey on your website. Absolutely. I think that's always the tough thing is figuring out how to put ourselves in the right place or how to check for these things. And I think most of the people who are watching today who, have, who are participating with us are interested. They think it's an important thing to make sure that websites are accessible. But it's one thing to be able to say it. It's another thing to do it. And it's a whole other thing to know even what to look for on those. So I'd like to um, turn the question a little bit to how do we do those types of things? So Mike, you brought up the example of using the keyboard to navigate through a site emulating somebody who may not have control over a mouse or um, might not have the dexterity. And that could be for a number of reasons. What other sorts of tools do you use to check through a website uh, at that basic level that maybe somebody who's trying to be better about their accessibility, but is not sure where to start could get started with that? Yeah, so there are a number of like accessibility tools. Um, and I think like Kat's gonna maybe demo or talk so about some of those they get you maybe so far they can identify things like contrast issues or like improper 
um, what do you call it, like Aria roles and things that are easily like, you know, that a machine can easily look at. But there are a lot of other things that like you have to be human uh, in order to realize. So, I you know, you just mentioned things like keyboard navigation right there. Um, the, is the focus state discernible, you know? And, and uh, like I was, I was talking about this a couple of days ago, I, I have a Roku on my TV. And so I use like a little remote control to navigate around and different apps have different focus states for like the TV shows that you're gonna look at. And there's, there's uh, at least one app I can think of cough disney plus that doesn't have a really good focus state so i look at if i look at the screen i don't know what i'm what I, like like what's active right now so if i hit the okay button i don't know if it's if this show is going to come up or this show is going to come up you know the, the, a lot of people use websites the same exact way as that because they can't use them out so they don't know where the pointer is you know and that's something to think about so the easiest thing to do is just start tabbing around and if you can tab around and then you shift tab and get used to that, can you access those, you know, can you figure out how to get around the web page? Does it jump in around in all crazy places? Does it go like from the top to the bottom, to the middle, to the edge? No, like, if, is it how you expect it? You know, like, like that goes a long way right there. And, and, and I think with most things accessibility, uh, the hard part is finding the issues. A lot of times uh, fixing the issues uh, is like, more straightforward. Great. Well, I want to ask you, Kat, about, oh, I'm sorry, Kat, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to totally agree with what Mike said about, you know, keyboard tabbing is the easiest thing to do, just tab and shift tab. So you could do that. Um, also remember that if you have a Mac, you have voiceover, so you can use the screen reader mm -hmm. that's built in. And nowadays, you know, it used to be that, you, had, you know, JAWS, you had to get JAWS, um, for Windows, um, they have NVDA now, so that's free. Um, so you can download that for Windows as a screen reader. Um, so you can test for, for screen readers with uh, different operating systems. There's also, is it Orca, I believe, for Linux? So am I wrong? I think I'm right on that. <laughs> I should look that up. Um, and so there's, there's always different options for that. Um, there's tons of different extensions for, I, I have tons of extensions on Chrome that I have installed that I test um, for different accessibility um, issues um, constantly. So there's some that are with dev tools with Chrome. Um, and then there's some that are just like um, ex actual extensions. So there's some that you have to go to the dev tools to get to access to it and that are more robust. And then there's some that are just really quick. So there's also some pretty cool bookmarklets that help. So there's tons of things out there and it, it, they're not all obviously uh, Firefox and all of the other browsers have their own versions of those as well. So we'll try to demo those uh, whenever it's time and, and try to show those off. So, and um, I do have an article that I could um, link to at some point and and has a links to a bunch of those that people could check out. That's excellent. I feel like we could probably come up with a great list of resources in terms of tooling for things like that, articles that we uh, have written ourselves or even that we find particularly useful. So I don't know, Matt, if there's a way we can share those resources out with the, uh, the visitors, the viewers later on, or we can answer some of those in the chat here as well. We can try and compile them as we go instead of reading them all off to you and trying to read out URLs. Um, but we do actually have a question from one of our attendees. They would like to know, and if we have a couple we can spit off the top of our head, that's great. Otherwise, we can compile them or answer them back in the chat here. Uh, if they want to know if we could share some links to really well-crafted and accessible websites that, that we think they've done an amazing job. So, you know, along the lines of try and emulate what they did with this site as you're putting accessibility into yours. So does anyone one. have one off the top of your head? Helena, please go for it. I do. It's the Gray Muzzle Organization. Um, they did such a great job with their website. There's, um, if you if you visit graymuzzle.org, uh, it's a dog rescue, which is very uh, close to my heart. But also they have um, all sorts of different options for accessibility. There's a dyslexia button that'll put it in Lexifont, which is debated whether or not that is helpful for dys dyslexia, but it's cool that they put it in there. There's um, a contrast button. You can change the text size on the whole website based on what you need. Um, they really put a lot of thought into it in a really cool way. 
I, uh, I just brought that up. And so several years ago, Helena and I wrote this article uh, back when like um, Hillary Clinton was going against Donald Trump. And so we're auditing those websites for accessibility and Hillary Clinton's was almost perfect, except for this modal that popped up. And the modal was not focusable. And so I went to this gray muscle That's website. So they're cool. doing the they're doing the exact same thing on gray muscle. No. They are, yeah. Yeah. Go there in incognito. And it's so when you go to this website, this modal pops up. And so modals are interesting with accessibility right here, right? So um, you have to be able to dismiss them. You have to be able to focus into them. So typically when a modal pops up, you want to do a focus trap. So you can't even focus outside of them. So I'm looking at this website right now. This modal pops up. There's no way to dismiss this modal. I can't hit the escape button. I can't tab into it. And and so basically for a a non-mouse user person, um, this modal is not able to get rid of. So... I imagine whatever developer built this amazingly accessible website mm-hmm. is furious that someone put constant contact modal <laughs> over it. Yep, yep. Um, I think, Helena, you need to pick another website now. I'm just uh, kidding. <laughs> another one offhand. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to uh, kind of swoop and poop on your on it right there. No, that was a good catch. I'm bummed yeah. that that's on there. Sorry, gray muzzle for the uh, <laughs> for the recognition slash correction. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, but Twitter's made some really good strides. Now you can, uh, well, for a while now, it's been a buried feature, but you can add um, alternative text to your tweet by turning that setting on in the settings menu. So if you're tweeting yeah. a lot and you're tweeting photos, please turn your alternative text on and use it. Mm-hmm. I think that's Absolutely. one that a lot of people know about that. Um... I honestly, well, I haven't used Twitter in a long time, but forgot about Instagram also does this now too. And I believe since Instagram is part of Facebook, they can do that now as well. You have the option of adding alternative mm-hmm. text to your images in your posts. So yes, big thumbs up for that. Please do that. Facebook also has really primitive AI. So if you don't do that on your Facebook, Facebook will attempt to make alternative text for you. It oh, that can't pretty, go wrong. Pretty bad. <laughs> Um, but it's cool that they're working on it, and I have hope for it being good in the future. That's really the, good to know. The site that I would recommend would be actually the National Federation of the Blind, but, um, you know, and, and so. yeah, and <laughs> I want that one preface for that is imp- it's important to know that, like, I think we all know all sites are going to have errors. So I go to that site and I run a quick scan, and it's going to have errors on its site. So there is no perfect site that has no accessibility issues. Um, all sites are going to have some kind of issue and they're all a work in progress. But if you look at their site um, and if you go tab through their main navigation, it's all tabbable. If you look at the, how things are organized, um, there's plenty of white space. If you look at their, um, their links and stuff like that, you know, um, their headings are a different color. Um, those kinds of things are just really important things. Um, and like uh, even on their main navigation, they have indicators for their drop downs and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So those are, those are important things um, to keep in mind when, when you're um, creating a site. So. Oh, uh, the NFB site, this, this is nfb.org. This is a Drupal site too. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah it is Drupal 8. Cool. Um, we have a question. It says, are you using Chrome for testing? Sorry, I'm taking over your job, Chris. Sorry. Go for it. <laughs> are you using Chrome for testing keyboard navigation? I used Firefox at first and was alarmed by how buggy its keyboard nav is. So I would like to um, say, Kat, that you are a better host than Chris. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. So we can force mute nice. him, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, my answer is yes. I use Chrome for everything personally um and then i go and check things in firefox and and uh, ie and everything else um but yeah that's my answer yeah so uh, chrome chrome developer tools has um x core built into x core is like an open source project uh put together by dq systems and um it's it's basically an automated accessibility 
accessibility checker where they check all that stuff that's easily checkable like contrast uh like your headings and you know uh link text and things like that and and it, it, uh, what's kind of neat about um chrome developer tools uh you go to the audits tab and it gives you like a score at the end you know and they're very honest after it too they have some text that say hey we can't check everything this requires human checking and here's a link on how to do that there's actually another uh, tool that i've started uh, using called accessibility insights for the web um sure. mike gifford actually talked about um this tool it's in, and i've you can run um, uh, automated and manual testing using the tool. Neat. And it just talks you through it, not literally, but <laughs> with the uh, instructions. So, um, and I did do um, some an audit of a site with that. And and I found it to be really useful in that way as well. So, so that's another option. And it's free. I love free. Yeah, I imagine paying for any sort of that software could be a pretty big barrier to entry when you're trying to do something that would help everybody else out. And I'm glad to see that there are so many more options now coming up that are free instead of, like was mentioned earlier, having to pay for software like JAWS. I remember years ago, that was a big barrier for a lot of small companies to try and pay for that to make sure they were doing it right. All right, oh, I think we've got another question coming in. So I'm gonna jump to the next question. Uh, Amber says, I'm in the midst of producing an ex I'm gonna try that again. I'm in the midst of producing an accessibility report that we need at the request of some vendors. Well, that's great. Do you have any tips for scoping accessibility testing for Drupal sites? If I have sample pages of each content type and each view mode, is that good enough? Ooh, that's a good question. That is a good one. I think the answer is it depends. Um, if you have a lot of content that users or, you know, the editors are putting up there, it might not be accessible from page to page, even if you accessibility test the whole content type, because they may upload an image into that body field, never put alternative text or do something weird like that. Um, so I don't think it's ever going to be bulletproof unless you really have somebody go through every single page and check. Um, but I think you'd get the broad strokes with that. Um, I would Give say them that caveat. I'm going to assume that it's Drupal 8. So if it's Drupal 8, she should be fine because alt text is required with Drupal 8. Um, so that should be okay. The important thing with that though is it's not just alt text, adding alt text is meaningful alt text. So you want to make sure that the alt text that is added to the images is very meaningful to a person that is using a screen reader and that they can look, not look, that they can hear what the image um, is, is the alt text for the image and then understand what the image is. So that would be really important. Um, it is Drupal 7. Okay, so if you're Drupal 7, then you're going to run into, uh, you know, that problem of alt text not being required. So that would be something you'd want to go into the, the settings. Um, I think uh, you can still do that in Drupal 7. And and make it a required field. Um, and then after that, let's see, what else? What would, other, what would be some other things that you would uh, think, team? That's kind of what uh, I think, I, but we should probably keep it moving because we've got just a few minutes left. Okay. Yeah. I, I, would, I would just, the only other thing I would say is just identify some global elements. So header, footer, um, tables, um, form elements, things like that, and make sure that you um, do identify those on the site and, and audit those. Totally. Great. So we've talked a lot about identifying places that we could be doing better or looking at sites that exist and figuring out how to fix those issues. Fixing them, as Mike said, is a totally different issue than identifying them. And I know in, we tend to deal mostly in Drupal here at Lullabot. So given the right things, as Kat mentioned, Drupal 8 and then 9 will have alt text, the alt attribute required, which is always something you should never change. Uh, it should always be required. But let's take a look at things from the other perspective. You know, we're talking about accessibility awareness today. 
And really we should be doing this from the ground up. We should be thinking about this as we construct new sites. So I'd like to know what is something, I think of the right way to phrase this now, you've got a stakeholder that wants you to build their site. How are you selling them that it's going to take a little bit longer than maybe they anticipated because they didn't put in any sort of requirements for accessibility. And you're seeing these flaws come through in their designs. Maybe there's not enough contrast ratio or they've developed modals or other pieces that you have to sell it to them that this is the right thing to do. What sort of conversations have we had in the past? What sort of backing do we have from our company that we might be able to share as we developed our working group to help empower other teams to have those conversations and to get that up front? I know that's a very vague and open-ended question, but I don't want to pigeonhole it too much. So let the ideas yes. flow. So I have thoughts on this. I know you do. Yeah. So when I'm doing my estimating and when I'm doing my work, I just assume I'm going to make this thing accessible as, as accessible can be, be. So when, when my project manager comes to me and says, hey, Mike, can you estimate you know, creating this modal functionality? When I create that modal functionality, I'm going to assume that I'm going to do a focus trap. I'm going to assume that I'm going to bind the escape key to close it. And I'm going to assume that you know I'm meeting all the contrast requirements. Now, pretty much, Pretty much all modern um, kind of patterns on the web can be made accessible, and I say pretty much, but 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 a lot of them can be made very accessible. So, like if someone wants a carousel for whatever reason, we can make. I'm gonna I'm gonna bundle in my time to make that accessible. And if if someone wants a a, a mega menu with tabs or something in there, I'm gonna make sure that's accessible. And, and that's just part of it. Uh, every once in a while there comes in, you know, like, especially if we're working for a third party design agency, we might have some, um, some designs that are not accessible. Typically it comes down to contrast. And with things like that, what I typically do is, is, is I will say like, all right, well, if I, I, I will make it as easy for the stakeholder to agree to this as possible. Say like, hey, I see that this isn't gonna pass WCAG criteria. You know, that might be a problem. If we make this one change right here, which would be simple to do, it'll do it. Typically they're gonna say, yeah, just go ahead and do it. You know, sometimes you might get pushed back and at that point it is what it is. But yeah, it, like from my point of view, it's, it comes to baking it in to everything. Absolutely. That's something I always bring up with clients when they're like, well, let's do accessibility at the end if there's time left over. Um, I always like to explain like, well, retrofitting it at the end is going to take way more time than building it properly to begin with. So it'll cost you more money to get there in the end and it'll take even longer. Uh, so let's just do it right the whole way through. Um, and I do try to bring it through the entire process. Like now that I'm on the sales side of things, it starts with even the first email when someone reaches out to potentially work with us. I always say like, hey, I'd love to hop on a call with you. But if you'd like to handle this by email, that's great too. Because I don't want to assume that the person I'm speaking with, even this potential stakeholder, isn't deaf or, you know, has a, a anxiety disorder or something where they don't want to talk on the phone. So it's about being considerate, not just to the end user, but to the developers and the stakeholders in between as well. Yeah, and sometimes you're going to get pushed back. I mean, it just really depends on the environment you're dealing with. Um, you know, like I said, I met, I've worked in local government, so I had a lot of pushback with local government. It's a totally different world than the private industry. So, um, you know, when you work with a, like a county, like I worked for, you have, you know, the appointed officials and the elected officials and the regular workers and so you have all of this stuff and people are used to doing things their certain way um so you know i'd say an example um that i have from that would be like the pdf documents um people scanning them in used they're used to scanning those in and um the zoning department just is you know loves doing that so much and trying to get them you know <laughs> to stop scanning in the documents and explaining that those are images and um you know, really for me, it was really about um, bringing them in and, and, and showing them what, what it's like for a screen reader to hear that or to read it aloud um, and trying to build some empathy for, for, those, um, for those employees. And, and right. you know, you're not always gonna win that fight and that's important to know um, whether it's if you're in local government or whether you're in a, an agency 
there are going to be people, be people that you're just never going to win over. And, but you should always try. And like Mike and Helena were saying, you should always just build it into your regular practice. And when you get to those um, times when people are, are kind of pushing back, what I always like to go to is the WCAG requirements and getting like the documentation or a section 508 or the ADA, things like that. Whenever people see those and they see it in writing from an off authority, that seems to help a little bit more than it coming from your mouth. So, Or hearing examples of other companies similar to theirs that have been sued. I mean, not that I want to like raise this like specter of a boogeyman, but it's true. You know, we we get some clients that are like, well, I'm private sector, so I'm not bound to that. And I'm like, okay, well, here's lawsuits and companies similar to yours. And they're like, oh, we should we should do that then. Um, But I was I was laughing about your PDF upload thing because I'm a glutton for punishment and I volunteered to do my HOA's website, which has been such a joy for me. Um, But. (laughs) <laughs> they had all these PDFs and I was like, Hey, you know, these aren't accessible. We need to find another way to present this information to the community. And the HOA president at the time, he goes, sure, put my phone number. And if anyone has a problem with the PDFs, I'll read them to them on the phone. And I'm like, that's not a solution for this. <laughs> Please let's come up with something else. So we did and it, it worked out, but um, it was a creative solution. So what's the solution there? Is the solution to just kind of fix the PDF? Do you did you do you move it into like HTML? Um, we moved it to it, HTML, but yeah. you can fix the PDF. I mean, there are PDFs that are very accessible, but it's like the flat image ones that are just completely yeah. inaccessible. The image of text, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Mm-hmm. So well, we have a couple when, of questions that have. Oh, I'm sorry, Kat. I, um, um, I want to get no, back to ahead. here. I just want to make sure we don't go over time because we do have a couple yeah, of questions fine. that came Keep in. Um, let, let, let's do this. Before we yeah. read that question aloud, I'm going to say, let's not name any company names of things that that we're panning here. Um, I appreciate the question, but we shouldn't say their name. Fair enough. Um, so Kat, go ahead and finish up your last thought there and then we'll jump into a couple questions. Oh, I was just going to say, um, PDFs, just, you know, it's important to look at analytics and see which PDFs are not being visited, get rid of them, clean house, throw them out. Um, Marie Kondo. Find source docu- yeah, that's right. Marie Kondo. Um, get source documents, convert them to PDFs, uh, and um, convert as many to HTML documents as you can. It's really about just coming up with a plan. Um, and hopefully I'll have a, an article in the future about that. Um, on our site and uh, we can, I can share some information about that. Excellent. Good stuff. That's one thing I never thought of until very recently is PDFs and those types of image, you know, the graphics with the image or with the text on them and files that have to go along with it as well. Okay, so to our question board, uh, Brian has a question for us. How do you handle clients not following through on adding accessible content when they're entering things into the CMS? So it sounds like from an editorial level, for example, not entering alt text into the images that they're uploading. Upgrade them to Drupal 8. <laughs> yeah, like th- th- there's some truth to that. And I'm, and I'm sure you can do it under Drupal 7 too, but um, like making things required help out, but at the same time, that also doesn't stop the editor from just like typing in X, Y, Z on the alt text just to get past the form, you know? Image. And yeah, and in, in that particular case, it's it's almost worse than no alt text or no alt text at, at that point, you know? Um, and and, as, and in, in addition to that, there's, there's um, I have a dog barking here because <laughs> I have long kids here. Uh, I'm going to pass while this dog starts barking. I'm going to mute myself. What I would right, do is I'm going to pick up where, oh, oh. Okay, all pick up where Mike left off on that uh, thread of thought where he was saying um, about the alternative text because it's true. If you make it required, and there are people who will just write like image or picture and move on with their lives. So it's important to have that conversation with your client about like what the purpose of that alternative text is. Um, I like to use a picture of a zebra that I show them 
Well, I don't show them the picture of the zebra and I wait and I say, okay, I'm gonna describe something to you and I want you to tell me what this picture should look like. And then I just say like a whole bunch of nonsense words. And then I show them the zebra and I'm like, did you have a zebra in your head? No? Okay, well that's why we need to use alternative text properly so that people understand what this is supposed to be and not use like alternative text for uh, like SEO juice or anything like that because that is not what it's for. Sorry, Kat, what were you gonna say? No, I think you covered it. That was, oh, good. That was good. Good job. I, I, also, I also want to bring up, uh, there's a Drupal module called Editorial Alley. So it's like, edit, let me just post this in the chat here. Um, but uh, uh, this module is, I think it's for Drupal 8 and Drupal 9, and, and uh, actually for Drupal 7 too. And it's, I believe it's made from, by the folks at Princeton University. And it's basically like a checker for the, editor, the editorial team. So it'll do things like if you have link text that just says click here, it will suggest to you say to modify that link text. So it's like something more descriptive besides click here. Or, the, or if you have an, if you insert an image into your WYSIWYG editor without an alt text, it'll, it'll, it'll catch that and let you know that. Um, and, and that's, that's a pretty cool tool. So it sounds like what it comes down to is it's a combination of training and having the developers who can implement certain guardrails for the team as well. Uh, you know, it's the, the infamous body field. You can put anything into the body field and if they let you do it, and that's not always a good way to go, but it does take a tremendous amount of work to make sure that your WYSIWYG editor, like you said, Mike, is using the right tools. It's filtering the right content. It has the right restrictions to make sure the alt text on your media embed is required. So when you have to Brian to try and answer the rest of your question here, uh, for things like alt text on images, there's a few ways to go around that. But I think training your editorial staff or using the module like Mike recommended is a great way to start so they understand the importance of it. And then Educating sometimes what we have to do when we're working with other teams is educating their developers on the right way to do things and how to tweak Drupal and bend it the right way to put those guardrails in place. So sometimes clients just aren't open to that and we do whatever we can to try and get them to see that. Helena had some great recommendations on ways to convince clients that they should be paying more attention to it. But ultimately it's understanding it's that education and finding the balance of what we can do from the programmatic standpoint and what we can do to educate the editors so that they're not just copying and pasting a whole bunch of junk into the body field. So I hope that answers your question. And of course, if there are follow-ups to any of these after we're done here, feel free to reach out to any of us at Lullabot. We're happy to answer questions and talk about this offline as well. Uh, we do have one more question to get to though. So hopefully I'm not pushing us too far over. Uh, this person asks, how do you talk with clients about not using widgets, overlays, and what like, um, and well, I always say carousels belong on playgrounds, not websites, but that's my own beef. Uh, so how do you talk with clients about not using those components that are traditionally very accessibility prohibitive? Or is this person was asking a, a prepackaged accessibility product that is like a widget overlay? Um, mm -hmm. Anyone have an example of how they've had to deal with that where the client really, really wanted to use an inaccessible library or something like that, that jumped something onto the screen and you had to try and talk them down? I've never like really so... dealt with that. I've never really dealt with that directly. Like, like there's several vendors out there that make what they call like accessibility overlays and they charge, you know, a monthly fee to insert some JavaScript and that puts things like, you know, to make it, it'll give you like a little, kind of like little floating sidebar to make your text larger, increase your contrast and do things like that. But that's like almost like worse than a Band-Aid and, you know, and, and I don't know if that's what the- Dirty uh, Band-Aid. Yeah, it's like a dirty Band-Aid with like, you know, dirt smeared into it. You're sticking on your website and it, 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 it you know, it can help out with like contrast. And of course it can help out with text size and things like that. But 
a couple of things that it can't help out with is like, you know, your overall site structure. Uh, the fact that you might be using a div where you need to be using a button. The fact that like not everything is keyboard navigable and, and, and things like that. That that is where these things fall short. And, 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 and so people, people stick this stuff on their website and they think, Hey, I am now protected against these lawsuits. And I, you know, in addition to that, people can now use my website and it's kind of a fallacy that it doesn't work that way. There's a, there's a website was it's like overlay fact sheet or something like overlay fact where a number of accessibility um, practitioners and, and folks got together and they basically said, this is crap. You can't do this, and it's not it's not a big deal. I'll throw that in the in the chat too. So that that might answer that question as, as far as the accessible overlays. But if you're talking about like other types of widgets, like I, I've had conversations before. Well, like, hey, you know, it's going to be tough to do this correctly. But you know, from my point of view, a carousel can be made to be accessible. You know, and then a modal can be accessible like most things can be accessible. It's just, you know, the amount of effort that goes into it, you know, um, and you can maybe talk about bad patterns and things like that to the, to the customer, but that goes into like, you know, design too, you know. I will dive in here since we're toward the end and I will say yeah. that if you do have a site that is inaccessible and you are tempted to use an accessibility overlay, what you should do instead is send us an email at sales at lullabot.com uh, we have a team of brilliant professionals and we would be happy to help you fix the accessibility on your website for real. And, and we've done that before. I've worked for like, like I, like in between projects, I've worked for our support and maintenance department. And, you know, one project that I was recently on is I was working for a, for an eng engineering uh, department for a, for a university and their navigation was not um, fully accessible. You know, and, and I was like, well, this sounds like fun because as I mentioned earlier, this is like my pet peeve, you know, so, so they had drop downs and their drop downs were not accessible. So, you know, I, you know, this is an old, this is a Drupal 7 site. So I wrote some jQuery to, you can use your arrow navigations to get around. And I added some focusable elements in there to indicate that that was the case. And uh, yeah, and, and honestly, it took less than a week to do that. And now their navigation is, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely not perfect, but it's, it's usable, you know, it's, people can use it. That's great. So I don't want to, we have one, it looks like a response to that question through our question board. So I'm, I don't think I see a question in there. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Question asker, anonymous attendee, if I'm missing a piece of that, but and it sounds like it all kind of comes back again to education. And there's only so much you can do as the outside vendor, which is where we often find ourselves at Lullabot, because you end up with the marketing person who really wants the tool, but you have to teach them your tool is not accessible. How are you going to balance that? So we do what we can to try and educate. And I'd like to kind of turn back around to that angle as we wrap up here. And Kat, I would like to ask you, because you mentioned this a few times, WCAG. Could you, for anyone who's listening today, who's uh, hanging along with us, who's not exactly sure what that means or what those levels are or where to find that information, how do I know if I'm doing something wrong or not? What those resources are that we usually go to when we're trying to figure out, are we doing the right thing or how do we look for them? Like, what does WCAG mean? What are the different levels? Kind of take us through that briefly. You're muted, Kat. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're good. So uh, WCAG is, um, it was uh, created by W3C, so it's Web Content Accessibility. Uh, you got me drawing a blank. WCAG guidelines, there we go. Um, and there's the different levels. There's three levels, A, AA, and AAA. So you always want to shoot for A and AA. Um, and those are the ones that most people shoot for. You can try to go for the AAA, but that's not like a required thing. The, the level A and AA are what you wanna shoot for. Um, and that's uh, when you talk about like ADA, ADA and section 508 and all of those, that's what, they, that's what they go for. And also international standards generally go for the level A and AA. Um, so I think the, AA is the, is the standard, right? Yeah, there are actually international standards that only go for the A, which is kind of crazy, but 
Um, but I would always just go for the, tr the double A and um, the, the A and AA, that just means the complications. So the A is the simplest, the AA is a little bit harder and the AAA is the hardest. So, um, sure. so if you just Google WCAG, you'll be able to get those pretty easily. I was going to say the Drupal cores, um, uh, Drupal core out of the box is uh, WCAG double uh, A compliant. So, yeah, and, and that's a core gate. Before anything can become stable in Drupal core, it needs to be, it needs to meet that accessibility gate. If you hit double A, you should also be hitting 508 compliant for the most part. Mm -hmm. I think those correlate pretty nicely together. Yeah, it used to be different, but they, they really, um, when they did the refresh, they really aligned them really well. A section 508 refresh, so. That's pretty great. So I didn't know that Drupal 8 out of the box themes, modules, core that come with, well, themes, the modules that come with core all have to be WCAG AA compliant. Yeah, and the, and there's also like the author accessibility. Hold on, what's the ATAG? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also yeah, ATAG compliant, like authoring tool accessibility guidelines. And what that means is the like the actual authoring experience. You know, using the WYSIWYG buttons, being able to upload images, and that also needs to be accessible. Wow. Very cool. There's a lot that goes into it. Like yeah. a lot. Well, I think we're coming up on time here. So I would like to thank everyone who asked questions and uh, helped the conversation along. This was some really informative stuff. I always learn stuff at this too. So hopefully you all did as well. If you'd like to ask us more questions, we are on Twitter. So please follow us at Lullabot on Twitter. Ask us anything and we'll be happy to help answer your questions. The chat here in Zoom has some links that we've been talking about as we go uh, to some of the resources that we use and some resources on our own website on lullabot.com about the articles we've written, the different niche areas of accessibility that we've gotten into. Uh, and with that, any closing remarks from anybody? Um, I just added a link to the tools. I didn't get a chance to demo those, but I did add the link there. So just go check those out. There's lots of tools on there and there's lots more that aren't even in the article. So hopefully you get a chance to go on there and try them out. Um, but it was great to talk with uh, the team here and I really appreciate it. And thanks for everybody's time. Yeah, thanks yeah. for hanging out with us and happy yep. Global Accessibility Awareness Day. All right. Yep. Bye, everybody. All right. Take Thanks, care. everybody. Bye.